beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Cheers. So, here's the tea. Or gin and tonic. Because 2020 is a hellscape and I'm too sad to be sad, I decided to not be my normal Grinchy self this year and instead embody some Christmas spirit. But come on, you know me. I gotta make it spooky somehow. So let's talk about Christmas's spookiest movie. Well, the spookiest one you can watch with your kids at least. The Nightmare Before Christmas was directed by Henry Selleck and released in 1993, working as an adaptation of a 1982 poem written by Tim Burton, who is also credited as creator and producer of the film. The film is set in a fantasy realm where different towns are responsible for different holidays and tells the story of Jack Skellington, the king of Halloween Town. After a particularly festive existential crisis, Jack stumbles through a portal into Christmas Town and quickly becomes obsessed with celebrating the holiday and insists on creating and sharing a Christmas of his very own with his town and the children of the world, though with slightly disastrous results. The Nightmare Before Christmas had a somewhat unusual development, so briefly, the Walt Disney Company purchased the rights to the property after a 1982 pitch from Tim Burton for a short film or holiday special while he was still working with them. It was, however, dropped because it was too weird for the company to develop, which, alongside the muted response for Disney-produced short films Vincent and Frankenweenie, led to Burton being fired from the studio in 1984 as Disney felt they were unable to offer his nocturnal loners enough scope. Glossophobia never rests. But let's put a pin in that for later. But in 1990, and after Burton established himself as a financially viable creator with films like Beetlejuice and Batman, Disney relaunched the project with a modest and perhaps too safe $18 million budget. After a near three-year production, it was released under Touchstone Pictures, the Walt Disney Company's film distribution label which featured films with more mature themes targeted towards adult audiences. Because, at the time, Disney considered Nightmare to be too dark and scary for kids, and were worried that regular release would deter its key audience. Disney had been burned with previously released horror-inclined pictures before. Films like The Watcher in the Woods and The Black Cauldron in the 1980s were financially disastrous, so it wasn't surprising that they didn't want to take that huge a risk with Nightmare. Despite this though, Nightmare was a success, grossing $90 million after a moderate first run and a successful re-release under the main Disney brand in 2006, perhaps indicating Disney's developing interest in melding children's entertainment and the horror genre. Earning an Oscar nomination for Best Visual Effects in 1994, and it continues to be commended as a truly beloved cult text and a successful horror musical. The Nightmare Before Christmas is a really interesting text, even without its development and cultural afterlife of Hot Topic merchandise and emo kid nostalgia. Firstly, Disney basically picked the project back up to be a sort of shining example of the creative potential of the company in the new decade, with then Disney president David Hoberman elaborating, we can think outside the envelope, we can do different and unusual things. Particularly post Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which exhibited groundbreakingly creative special effects and a much darker narrative than other Disney pictures, while also being released under Touchstone, Disney wanted to fund more unique and perhaps more subversive projects, at least in terms of narrative and aesthetic conventions established by Disney's regular pictures, that displayed clear technical and storytelling achievements and broke the mould of what the company was traditionally known for in the past, in keeping with Walt Disney's own sort of obsession with technical innovation. And boy, did Nightmare live up to these high expectations. It has an incredibly specific and deliberately curated cinematic vision that encapsulates the best parts of Tim Burton's iconic, gloomy aesthetic and Henry Selleck evident directorial prowess. As well as this, it's just a really good looking film. It's visually striking with a beautifully spooky colour palette, something Olsen writes as being an important tool to precondition its young audience to see the film's saturated colours as desirable, and some excellent creature and character designs that display clear influence from big name classical horror monsters, thus associating with a rich tradition of cinematic horror that Burton was obviously inspired by. Is this to say that Nightmare Before Christmas may be a foundational text for young horror fans, and actually offers an interesting kind of symmetry to the text, considering Burton's influence from classic monster movies? Maybe. It was to me, at least. From an aesthetic standpoint, The Nightmare Before Christmas was perfect for what Disney wanted at the time. It was spooky and at times frightening, but full of easily merchandised characters with plenty of post-2000s cultural afterlife. It was edgy and dark, but incredibly technically impressive, being shot entirely through stop motion, a film technique employed extensively in the horror genre. Just to interrupt, stop motion had its roots in some pretty creepy origins. For example, Polish filmmaker Ladislaw Stawicz employed the use of stop motion in a film about two beetles fighting each other by replacing the legs of two 
dead beetles and using the corpses as puppets for his animation. Matt Kim writes about stop motion, saying, Stop motion is a form of reanimation where physical objects gain lifelike movements. This same quality is also why stop motion has been used for so many horror projects. And even kid-friendly companies specialising in stop motion, like Leica and Aardman Animations, have somewhat unique interests in replicating horror and horror imagery. Going back to Nightmare, it was also a text that appealed to everyone, from children to critics, with Destin Thompson of the Washington Post even writing that the film shared similarities to the writings of Oscar Wilde and the Brothers Grimm, as well as the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and other German Expressionist films. And though this isn't that big of a surprise for Disney, considering Walt Disney's fascination with art history and the influence of various art movements on the studio's work, it still suggests a level of not only artistic prestige to the film, but also a level of horror prestige. And while I could do a deep dive into every horror theory present in Nightmare, and how it's a text that embodies anti-commercialism and cinematic vision and all the big words I learned in film school, I'm more interested in talking about this guy. As I said in the beginning, The Nightmare Before Christmas follows Jack Skellington, the pumpkin king of Halloween Town. He's absolutely beloved by its citizens, who he leads in celebrating Halloween while somehow outdoing himself each year. Privately though, Jack has grown weary and melancholic of doing the same thing year in and year out, and he yearns for something different. After sulking through the woods all night, he eventually stumbles across a circle of doors, but he is particularly struck by one shaped like a Christmas tree. When he falls through though, he finds himself in a technicolour wonderland straight out of a Christmas special called Christmas Town, and he quickly becomes obsessed with this new place that he's found and spends the rest of the film attempting to understand and recreate a Christmas of his very own. Jamie Freighter writes about Jack, saying, Jack is perfectly realised as a town hero, who seeks more in his life, or death as it may be, and he's frequently high up on Disney's most popular characters what with Jack's frequent takeover of Disney theme parks, his inclusion in Disney video game projects, and the sheer mass of officially licensed Nightmare Before Christmas merchandise. To me, though, Jack is more than just his iconic design, his charismatic personality, or his near-perfect voice acting, thanks to Chris Sarandon and Danny Elfman. I'd in fact argue that part of the reason Jack is so popular is because he embodies both tropes of a perfect gothic protagonist and a gothic boyfriend, which makes it easy for certain viewers to project themselves onto either Jack himself or his love interest, ragdoll slash Frankenstein girl, Sally. And before you call me out on making another video essay about my taste in men, I've already said it, so you don't have to. Let's get into it. Firstly, throughout the text, Jack is represented as a kind of textbook tragic hero, a narrative trope whose earliest iterations were originated in works like Sophocles' Oedipus Rex and Shakespeare's Hamlet. Aristotle writes of the Greek tragic hero, suggesting that they must invoke a sense of pity and fear within the audience, stating that the change of fortune presented must not be the spectacle of a virtuous man brought from prosperity to adversity. Additionally, the Aristotelian hero is characterised as a noble personage, a king perhaps, who is ultimately good and morally inclined, who commits, without evil intent, great wrongs that lead to their own misfortune. Tragedy and the gothic genre really go hand in hand too, so it's no surprise that the tragic hero comes up a few times in traditional gothic literature too, especially in texts like Frankenstein and the picture of Dorian Gray. Though, it's worth noting that the gothic has a tendency for these characters to lean away from tragic hero and into anti-hero territory, instead revelling in their hubris and ultimately being punished for it. Though his aesthetic, accompanying musical score and stereotypical melancholy lends him well to tropes of the gothic, Part of the reason that Jack doesn't verge into the anti-hero territory of most gothic protagonists is partly because of Nightmare's placement as a musical and its use of the I Want song. The I Want song is a song in a musical in which the main character sings about how they are unsatisfied with their current life and how they are searching for something different. Stephen Schwartz, composer of Wicked, said of the I Want song, in classic terms, the job of an I Want song is not to move the action forward, but to set up the desire of the leading character that will drive the action for the rest of the show. And the most prominent examples of the song include, not at all coincidentally, big Disney hits, Belle from Beauty and the Beast and Part of Your World from Little Mermaid. Jack is sympathetic and decidedly not an anti-hero because we are given not only an explicit I want song, quite a few actually, giving the audience a direct route into his inner life, but several prolonged moments dedicated to Jack's isolation and loneliness, scenes meant to humanise him. 
As well as this, his motivation, his desire for something different from Halloween Town and to challenge himself is understandable and something everyone experiences, unlike Frankenstein's desire for power and Dorian Gray's desire to be young, which are both rooted in significant narcissism and only makes them more unlikable. Even the act of giving Jack a love interest in Sally, something he didn't have in Burton's original poem, makes Jack more sympathetic, especially in the moments when we are positioned alongside Sally and see Jack through her eyes. The theory of the Aristotelian tragic hero is one that really encapsulates Jack's character. Character. Starting the story at a lofty position of privilege and prestige while yearning for another life, it's his own fatal flaw, his impulsiveness and selfishness, which leads to the near destruction of himself and Christmas. But because it's a Disney movie, Jack is able to redeem himself and the tragedy of his story though, but only because of his willingness to change and his open admission of his faults and mistakes. As well as these narrative tropes, Aristotle also said that music, or melody, was an important component to a Greek tragedy too, stating specifically that it had to blend into the play appropriately. Nightmare achieves this with a score of mostly minor key, and a leitmotif of low drawling tones and gentle piano that fits Jack's narrative art perfectly, all courtesy of Danny Elfman, one half of Jack himself, who also said that the process of writing for Nightmare was the easiest of his creative projects because of how easily he understood Jack's character. It almost feels like everything The Nightmare Before Christmas is doing adds to Jack's placement as a tragic hero, which lends itself well to defining him as the perfect gothic protagonist. Also, people have a crush on him. Now, in the past, I've discussed a number of different horror men, each one as attractive and violent as the last, notably through the scientific lens of the dark triad, as well as a few theories such as narrative theory and queer theory, and why they might be attractive to people despite their ghoulish appearances and actions. Jack isn't a dark triad contender by any means. He's not manipulative or violent, but he is still a character who, on the surface, is supposed to be scary. He says so himself. He's a master of fright and a demon of light, and he'll scare you right out of your pants. But despite his edgy appearance, Jack embodies a kind of joy and curiosity and hope despite his spooky setting. There's an honesty to his overflowing and genuine emotions, and in the climax of the film, an honesty to his open admissions of love that we're not especially used to seeing from male characters, associating him with not the traditional gothic male arch type, but one of a more vulnerable male power, aligning with sensitivity and a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings rather than rage, repressed emotions and avert sexuality. This concept is sort of replicated in text too, especially when we compare Jack to Nightmare's antagonist, Oogie Boogie, who might be associated with more traditional tropes of the gothic. Now, I'm going a little ham with this literary context and theories, but another part of the reason that Jack is so popular is because we like the way he looks. Arjo Romano wrote on Tim Burton saying, the Burton S style is derived from a wealth of art, cinematic and literary genres, citing German expressionism, the Gothic and Grand Guignol theatre, and a host of mid-century sci-fi and horror films as clear influences for his iconic aesthetic. Jack interacts with some heavy literary theories, but he does the part of being an emo icon. He's bathed in blacks and greys, darkness and shadow, especially interesting when comparing him to the film language of Oogie Boogie, with the latter dancing in day glow colours and singing with a lively jazzy twang. Jack in embodies his obvious gothic influence even when he tries to embrace and enjoy the more colourful and cheerful Christmas. His Christmas has a darkness attached to it that he can't shift, even when he tries to, because he can't remove himself from his gothic influences, a little bit like his creator. Now, remember my pen? My Tim Burton work for Disney pen? We could say that Jack's own narrative, his inability to fit in or understand the bright colours of Christmas Town, might replicate Burton's experiences and his own inability to fit in amongst the bright colours of Disney, this being the actual reason that Burton was let go from the company to begin with. Jack is explicitly an outsider, both in Halloween Town and Christmas Town. Despite his joy and enthusiasm, he cannot really exist in an environment which is normative or joyful, perhaps similarly to how horror and animation struggle to exist outside of their respective outsider environments. We might even compare Jack's experiences to one like that of a marginalised identity. How queer. Going back to vulnerable masculinity, the concept is especially exemplified in Jack's opening song, Jack's Lament, where he quietly sings to himself about how he has grown weary of celebrating Halloween and being the centre of attention of the townspeople, somewhat relating to my previous concept of the musical being particularly cathartic because of its openness, its ability to make visible what is traditionally hidden. Even before the song, he's almost shrinking away from the praise of his citizens, and when he sings, he reveals that the fame and praise mean almost nothing to him because nobody truly understands him or his feelings of detachment and melancholy. We're also given a good insight into Jack's extraordinary competence and righteous passion for duty, traits of the Aristotelian tragic hero, because he knows he's good at his job, so much so that it's almost effortless. But the work, the duty to his citizens, makes him feel empty and he longs for something else, even if that means giving up his crown. And after this willowy outpour of emotions, that coincidentally includes a reference to Hamlet, we see that Sally, already established as hopelessly in love with Jack, has heard it all, and when she quietly mumbles, Jack. 
that deliberately positions us, the audience, as participants of Sally's infatuation. I mean, who wouldn't relate to that? Maybe part of the reason that Jack is so popular with teenage girls is because when he opens his mouth, he speaks the thoughts of every alienated teenage girl in history, which again relates to the feeling of catharsis of both musicals and horror. This too suggests something interesting to be said about the denigration of the emo, be that a figure of literature and music or fashion, and how we as a society often belittle the emotions of these men and often belittle the women that like these men. Sally too sings about feeling like an outsider amongst the enthusiastic townspeople, never truly belonging and thinking that her love for Jack is unrequited, making her just as sympathetic as Jack is. So there is something beautiful about the climax of Nightmare, where the two meet on the snowy hill where Jack first sang, far away from the other citizens, and proclaim their love for one another in a sweet embrace under the light of a full moon. The inclusion of a Frankenstein-like monster in the movie, one that specifically relates to Jack, is a particularly interesting one. And you know, I do have to wonder if Frankenstein might be a metaphor for an experience of loneliness and isolation, a sort of childishness, not fitting into your environment or meeting the standards expected of you by normative society. Huh, I really can't think of one. Oh, right, Jack is autistic. In the conclusion of the film, after defeating Oogie Boogie and freeing Santa Claus, Jack ultimately comes to learn, after disastrous reactions to his rendition of Christmas, that he cannot completely change himself or shift his spooky, scary roots. While this is a somewhat confusing and perhaps troubling resolution to a kid's movie, where you can't do anything you want if you work hard at it, I think reading Jack as a bit atypical makes the ending a little more positive. Jack learns, much like many neurodivergent people learn, that maybe you can't completely change yourself to fit in somewhere you feel out of place. But maybe you can change a little, and maybe the world can change a little too. Maybe you can have some Halloween on Christmas, and it is through this mutual changing that a person may find their own place in the world. In the end, Jack also learns that he doesn't have to be Santa, he can still be the Pumpkin King, but he can use what he's learned from Christmas to make his Halloween even better. And it's his experience with Christmas that reignites his love of Halloween. Halloween. It's through what he learns in a world outside of his purview that makes him appreciate his own experiences. Hi Video Nasties, I hope you enjoyed this more Christmassy essay. <laughs> it's been kind of a wild year for me and for everyone probably, so I just want to thank everyone who's stuck around and enjoyed my work this year. A big shout out to my patrons for supporting me, and if you would like to support me further, you can swing over to my patron and throw me a buck or two. Otherwise, you can check out my Twitter where I post all of my hot takes on horror and random ramblings. So I hope you all have a very happy holiday season, whatever you celebrate, and I also hope to see you in the new year. Stay safe, video nasties and remember to always stay spooky.